I V M. It's just after sunset, June ninth, four hundred and one CE. We're standing on top of a hill in central India. Around us, we can hear the gentle rushing of water pouring through carefully engineered fountains and ponds, irrigating lush, sweet-smelling gardens. In the distance, off to the east, is a dull glow on the horizon. The torches burning on the battlements of the great Gupta provincial capital of Vidisha, one of South Asia's largest cities since the time of the Mauryas. To the south, though we cannot see it in the twinkling starlight, is the equally ancient Buddhist pilgrimage center of Sanchi, and away to our north is the famous old pillar of Heliodorus, the Indo-Greek ambassador whose inscription inaugurated our very first season. We are not here for an ancient Buddhist pilgrimage; we are here to watch something bold, new, unprecedented. You see, the hill where we are standing. Udayagiri, the mountain of the dawn, is unique. It happens to be positioned close to the Tropic of Cancer, which means that it's the ideal position to observe the coming and going of the glorious sun. Around us are tall sandstone pillars, which are very clearly copies of ancient Mauryan models, carefully positioned next to carved and measured stone astrolabes and sundials meant to track the movement of the heavens at this sacred place where astronomers and worshippers can feel the ebb and flow of cosmic time. In a natural passageway in the rock, a place usually bathed in shade, is the heart of Udayagiri. Here is the god that worshippers believe manifests that infinite force. Carved into the rock is an elegant-looking man resting his head on his arm as he reclines on the curls of a great serpent, surrounded by a flock of carved gods. Here is Vishnu. Next to the carving stands a man of flesh and blood, surrounded by a flock of courtiers. He is pretty simply dressed in white silk, but even from here his immense bulk is apparent, muscles rippling like a predator. If we were slightly closer, we would also have seen his proud hooked nose and handlebar moustache, and smelled his pungent perfume. From where we are, we can barely see the glitter of his heavy golden earrings, which have stretched out his earlobes just like those of all his courtiers. We can't see much of that wealthy gang, but we can catch distant chanting and the scent of incense burning. The man and his retinue are doing something very important, you see. They are putting Vishnu to sleep, a ritual still enacted today in modern Vishnu temples. And just like today, they will return to wake him up four months later, when the land has been made anew by the monsoon storm. We aren't important enough to join in something like that. We are just minor members of the court. Our job is simple. When the moon rises, we whack a drum. Oh, there it is. Let's give the signal. Immediately, the man straightens and steps forward in the passageway. His courtiers retreat to a safe distance, leaving him alone with the god in the night sky. As the moon ascends higher, its soft white light creeps slowly into the ravine. It surrounds the man, bathes him, and he glows resplendently in the moonlight as his court poets start to sing his praises and conch shells are blown. Now Vishnu is asleep. The world is in darkness, except according to these courtiers, this glowing fellow will protect the earth and keep it safe in the meanwhile. And can you blame them for believing that he's a friend of the gods? Here in Udayagiri, the ancient sacred heart of India, he stands bathed in moonlight next to the god of time, the god who maintains the cosmic order. What other explanation could there be for his splendor? Here he stands, Chandra Gupta the Second, son of Samudra Gupta, Lord of all North India. Tonight, we would be forgiven for believing that his name was meant literally. His father had been sea guarded, but this man, still shining pale in the soft shadows of the sacred rock, is very obviously moon guarded. I'm Anirudh Kanesetti, 
and welcome back to Echoes of India, a history podcast. This episode is mostly based on Michael Willis's fantastic book, The Archaeology of Hindu Ritual, which I highly recommend you read. So, Udaygiri, Udaygiri, Udaygiri. What's going on here? What's Chandragupta's deal? Over the last two episodes of this season, we've seen the many foundations of Gupta kingship. Episode 1 was Samudra Gupta's undoubtable military genius. Episode 2 was about their use of Sanskrit, especially in the royal eulogy or prashasti. Now in that episode, I said something about how these kings made a cocktail of sculpture, art, literature, religion, politics and astronomy. Technically speaking, they must have made multiple such cocktails because they were all drunk on fame. <laughs> But uh, definitely the strongest and most prominent of these cocktails was at Udayagiri. So let's have a taste. Why have I brought you here? As I said, Udayagiri in the 5th century was positioned very close to the Tropic of Cancer. which means that it's perfect for observing solstices and equinoxes the guptas were by no means the first people to figure that out in fact indians had been watching the sun and stars for at least 2000 years already by this point and the summer solstice is particularly important to the indian subcontinent because the monsoons which are so important to agriculture even today show up soon after the summer solstice So it's a pretty natural leap, right? If you're an ancient Indian and you don't know how gravity and planetary orbits work, you're going to think, okay, so there must be some kind of force here that allows us to observe this endless cycle of time at this particular spot. It must be sacred. Maybe there's a god here. So let's say you believe that. Which god do you think would have done something like this? How about this guy? The blessed Lord said, "Time I am, destroyer of the worlds." and i have come to engage all people with the exception of you the pandavas all the soldiers here on both sides will be slain that's the man himself vishnu the protagonist of myths and legends associated with heroism and kingship but also the preservation and or creation of the cosmos so through his connection to time and space which vishnu had in all fairness been associated with since the very earliest mentions of him in the rigveda you'd expect that yeah vishnu must be present in some form or the other to the igiri cool so now what do you do with this information turn it to your benefit of course so let's say you're chandragupta you know that over the last couple of 100 years as with so many other texts standard versions of the ramayana and the mahabharata have been written down on the subcontinent these vast constantly evolving stories were ancient indeed at their core and were generally pretty folksy and like mostly communicated orally the written down versions on the other hand definitely emerged within a literate sort of culture their compilations were paid for by royal courts and often reflected the courtly world view which meant that they lionized kingship and war and all these disturbing patriarchal values which will come to another episode now you chandragupta know that because of these stories vishnu is popular and relatable and also much more strongly tied to the idea of divine kingship than any other contemporary god and you chandragupta also control udayagiri where vishnu is supposedly present So what do you do if you're a political mastermind? You strengthen Udayagiri's connection to Vishnu so people associate Udayagiri with him. Then you strengthen your connection to Udayagiri so people associate Udayagiri with you. And in doing so, you create a very tangible, visible connection between yourself and Vishnu and create a very very potent, almost physical claim to power. Do you see where I'm going with this? Now I can't claim to have read Chandragupta's mind but it's beyond question that he utterly transformed Udayagiri which was once a pretty insignificant bunch of caves and sandstone cliffs not really much to say compared uh, to say Sanchi which thronged with Buddhist pilgrims monks and laity the first step in this transformation was to make the place beautiful a place suitable for a god to dwell in a place suitable for pilgrims to visit and chill out in The vast resources of the Gupta political network were brought to bear. Its artists, its sculptors, poets, engineers and priests would have been assembled and unleashed. The flat plateau of Udayagiri was transformed with reservoirs to collect rainwater and runoff. 
all connected with perfectly measured pipes and intricate channels flowing through manicured gardens planted with aromatic plants. As Michael Willis puts it, from the hot and dusty rocks of Udaygiri today, we have to picture a cool and wet environment. Water flowing and dripping everywhere in carefully organized channels, lovely plants and fragrant flowers growing in abundance, clear pools and tanks lined with lotuses and water birds. It would have exuded an air of natural splendor, but perfected and elevated by human hands into something of great beauty and auspiciousness. There may even have been a royal enclosure for kings to stay in, and Chandragupta, as we'll see, had very good reasons to repeatedly visit Udaygiri. The crux of these extraordinarily advanced waterworks, all this hydrological engineering, complete with waterproof tanks and even dams, was a huge reservoir at the head of the passage that we saw in the beginning of this episode. Here, Gupta engineering is even more apparent in its stunning simplicity. They carved huge platform-like steps into the passageway and released water from the reservoir onto them at a fixed rate. Since they knew the rate of flow of the water and the precise dimensions of each step, this long cascading fountain formed basically a colossal water clock next to which reclined that carving of Vishnu, the god of time, chilling out next to time made manifest by the hands of humans, sprinkled by cool mist to control the immense heat that these idols are believed to contain. And as we've seen, in this place, Chandragupta was able to use the astronomical position of the sacred site to establish his own relationship to Vishnu and to his namesake, Chandra, the moon, putting Vishnu to sleep every year on the 11th night of the bright half of the month of Ashadha, when the moon was waxing. For the next four months, according to legend, Vishnu sleeps as the monsoon clouds, borne by winds and immense pressure differentials across the Arabian Sea, enter South Asia, collide with the Himalayas and deposit their life-giving waters, flooding rivers and roads and fields and stopping everyone dead in their tracks. Even kings like Chandragupta, who spent most of the year on the move between military encampments and ceremonial capitals, would have had to stop and stay where they were, perhaps even at Udaygiri where, as mentioned, ruins of what seemed to be a royal enclosure can still be seen. As the god sleeps, darkness envelops the land and demons stir in the shadows. Now this brings up another question. If Chandragupta was allied with Vishnu and the forces of righteousness and light, or at least pretended that he was in his propaganda, then who was he trying to imply was the darkness? Who were the unrighteous ones who threatened his construct of cosmic order? We already know the answer. In fact, we heard some orthodox Brahmins raging at them in the very last episode. Outcasts will perform sacrifices on the triple fire with mantras embellished by the sacred Sanskrit syllables. The Mlecha king will destroy the four social orders. The Shaka will destroy the good conduct of his citizens and their devotion to their proper tasks. Chandragupta spent most of his reign, an astounding 20 years, constantly at war with the sole remnants of the Central Asian migrations into South Asia, the Shakas, the Indo-Scythians. These weed-smoking, booze-loving party animals had once been a potent force in North India around the turn of the millennium. And as we've seen in the previous season, by the time of Chandragupta, they were much less influential and actually pretty Indianized, calling themselves by a Sanskrit title readapted from a Persian one, Mahakshatrapa, Great Satrap. They controlled the wealthiest ports along the coast of Gujarat and they alone had survived the chaos that engulfed the Satavahanas and Kushanas to retain a constant presence in the global economy with beautiful silver coins adapted from the Indo-Greeks. On these coins, we can see these proud rulers and the emblem of their preferred faith, the Chaitya Hill, emblematic of Buddhism. Now, this of course didn't really go down too well with Chandragupta. He, like Samudra Gupta, had fought a civil war to come to the throne. His elder brother Ramagupta had been governor of the Gupta province of central India and had declared himself emperor immediately after Samudra Gupta's death. Ramagupta had then attacked the Shakas but they had defeated him and that created an opportunity for his politically astute younger half-brother to lead a coup. 
Now, since his claim to power was already a little shaky, Chandragupta's entire brand image was that he was basically Vishnu on Earth, which meant that he had to publicly subscribe to what we might call Hindu or maybe really Bhagavata ideas of social order, which meant that he was bound to attack the Shakas for political and religious purposes. Now, keep in mind that this was a time when Buddhism was still a very powerful religious force, and the idea that Buddha was actually an avatar of Vishnu would have gotten you laughed at. Buddhism was in competition with Bhagavatism and various other Hindu cults for royal patronage. Now, aside from that, Chandragupta also had a geopolitical imperative to attack the Shakas. The Gupta Politico Economic Network already dominated trade to Southeast Asia along the subcontinent's east coast. And if he could secure the west coast, the Guptas would blast onto the global stage as an unprecedented economic juggernaut. And so once again, their vast military machine was unleashed. As Kalidasa would put it, Then took place a fight tumultuous with the westerners on horses mounted. The twang of bows alone made known the contestants in that dust. The campaign was not immediately successful. Even though the Shakas had paid tribute to Samudra Gupta, they were in no mood whatsoever to submit outright and let his son Chandragupta take over their home. From central India, Chandragupta could constantly mount campaigns into Gujarat, ordering supplies brought by river to Vidisha. As the summer heat became unbearable and the campaigning season came to a close, he would have retired to Udaygiri to put Vishnu to sleep and publicly reaffirm his connection with the god. And Chandragupta was quite blatant about this, by the way. Some of his coins literally depict Vishnu giving him the symbols of kingship. Then, in the monsoon, when no wars could be fought, as supposedly Vishnu slept, both Chandragupta and the Shakas would have waited patiently till the arrival of the winter in the month of Kartika. Kartika is a cool, balmy month, ideal for moving large armies around in the tropical climate of South Asia. Its very name, as you might have noticed, is reminiscent of Kartikeya, the god of war. The flood waters would retreat, leaving the land lush and green and muddy and fertile, and once again Vishnu would stir, as though awakened by the trumpets and drums of the Gupta army being called to muster. In Udaigiri, the water tanks and reservoirs would have been filled to capacity, and the astrologers and sky watchers would have told Chandragupta that the eleventh day of the bright half of Kartika was approaching. It was time for him to wake Vishnu again, to prepare the weapons and martial instruments and rally his troops. But this ritual would not be enacted in front of the peaceful reclining Vishnu of the passageway, but a much more bellicose and kingly form. So let's follow the steps of the passageway, splashing with water to where they lead. They flow into a large pond, carved in front of the cliff face looking east, so that the sun's rays find it at dawn. They glitter off the lotus buds and reflect off the gently lapping waves onto a colossal carving that's so detailed it even has stone lotuses and waves merging with the real ones in the pool. This is Vishnu, but not Vishnu as you generally think of him. This Vishnu, you see, is an avatar, a descent of this eternal deity from the time and worlds of the immortals to the time and world of the mortals. He is immense, bulky, like Chandragupta is. His left arm rests on his left knee and his right arm on his waist, pivoting the strength of his thick, muscular body upwards towards his head. The weight of his effort is borne by his left foot, which crushes the coiled mass of a naga serpent that quails terrified at his feet. His head is that of a huge wild boar, an animal associated with strength, reins, fertility. Holding on to his tusk and staring with gratitude at his glaring eyes is a small elegant woman and next to him stand a crowd of gods and sages and two more beautiful women representing the Ganga and Yamuna rivers. Who is this avatara? After the great deluge, Pralaya ended the last universe. Vishnu slept on his great serpent, Anantasisha, the endless remnant, the residue of creation from which creation is remade. The demon Hiranyaksha watched as the universe was reborn and his eye alighted on the beautiful goddess Prithvi. 
earth. He seized her and carried her down to the deepest depths of the sea. When Vishnu awakened, he saw the plight of the earth. He turned into a colossal boar, Varaha, and dove into the ocean, where he killed Hiranyaksha. Then digging with his tusks at the bottom of the abyss, he found the earth and raised her up, up, back to the surface of the ocean. He then married earth and had a son by her. The parallels to Chandragupta and Udayagiri are striking and have been commented upon by scholars such as V.S. Agrawala and S.K. Goyal since the 60s. This is a metaphor in stone, a visual shlesha, and as the art historian Frederick Asher puts it, it provides cosmic significance to a historical event. Chandragupta, like Varaha, had emerged from the sea, Samudra, in his case Samudra Gupta. But you could also see Varaha, like Samudra Gupta, as being guarded by the sea, which is why he is seen dominating creatures associated with the waters, in his case, the Naga dynasty of West Central India, represented very appropriately quailing at his feet. Incidentally, the Naga dynasty were Chandragupta's in-laws. His wife, the princess Kubera Naga, bore him a daughter, Prabhavati, who would grow up to be an utterly fascinating woman. But wait, don't let me get distracted. We could actually quite viably interpret the Varaha as Samadra Gupta because it's a Shlesha and the whole point of a Shlesha is it's meant to be interpreted multiple ways. But let's focus on Prabhavati's dad instead. Now, Prabhavati's dad, Chandragupta, like this Varaha, was surrounded by the Ganga and Yamuna rivers. They were part of the Gupta imperial banner, and Prayaga, the confluence of their waters, was a major sacred site and imperial center. Chandragupta, like Varaha, was surrounded by flocks of adoring, terrified vassals. Indeed, some of the carvings next to Varaha are wearing Kushana costumes. And most importantly, Chandragupta, like Varaha, had seized and dominated the earth through his conquests. Now this is super important because what he's saying is that he is earth's lord, he is earth's husband, he has authority to make peace and war as he sees fit, and more importantly to give away and redistribute land to his allies and colleagues as he sees fit. Thus, every year, as Varaha awoke to save the earth, Chandragupta embarked on his campaigns to dominate the Shakas. Do you see how complex and potent the message would have been to any ancient Indian, at least one who was already a fan of the Guptas or happened to be religious? Here, astronomy, technology, religious belief, ritual and art are repurposed and reinvented. Tradition fused with innovation to become political propaganda of a mind-boggling degree of complexity and sophistication. What you and I witnessed in the beginning of the episode was no less than the invention of the Indian kingship that we are most familiar with. At this point, new, astounding, innovative, but also traditional status quo is tied into other potent ancient ideas of royalty, such as those of the Manasmriti. Like the sun, he burns eyes and minds. No one on earth can bear to gaze upon him. He is fire. He is wind. He is the sun. He is the moon. He is Yama, lord of dharma. He is Kubera, lord of wealth. He is Varuna, lord of justice. He is Indra, lord of gods, by reason of his power. It's utterly remarkable how even the most daring innovations in South Asian history are often couched in the language of tradition, isn't it? The elite audience of this spectacular propaganda were, as I said in the last episode, well trained in Sanskrit literature and literary devices, and they would immediately have grasped the significance of what Chandragupta was doing. They themselves would go on to readapt it multiple times, as we'll see over the centuries. But let's be perfectly clear about the significance of what had happened in North India in the early 5th century. Driven by much deeper factors and of course enabled by a great deal of agency and dumb luck, Samudra Gupta had established a template of the military king. Now his son Chandragupta established the template of the political and religious king, creating a special relationship with the gods and declaring himself Paramabhagavata, foremost devotee of Vishnu. Now, the kings weren't necessarily responsible for all this. They obviously had very large and talented teams of courtiers, but the principle still stands. Henceforth, to the Guptas, the Vishnu allegory would be all present. 
the king like vishnu is associated with the goddess lakshmi fortune who appears on his coins the king like vishnu is lord of the earth on gupta coins the messaging is on point but also adaptable for example when chandragupta finally overpowered the shakas and replaced their coins with his own he retained the same format but replaced the buddhist chaitya with the gupta garuda dhvaja the imperial eagle banner the same banner as that of vishnu himself you kind of get why chandragupta claimed the title of vikramaditya son of prowess at udayagiri he had successfully managed to tie his royal power to the coming and going of the glorious sun the idea of the divine king as the lord of the earth who could give away land to say brahmins and temples was no less than a revolution in economic organization a model that would dominate the subcontinent for the next 1000 years but not necessarily always a popular or even pleasant one strangely enough the clearest early indication that we see of this had little to do with any kings at all but instead a queen join us in the next episode of echoes of india to hear the story of prabhavati gupta chandragupta's daughter and one of the most remarkable women of her time i want to hear what you think of echoes keep in touch with me on twitter at akanisetti that's a k a n i c t t i or tag me in an instagram story just search for my name if you like this podcast you could also leave us a rating and a review and don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can listen to us on the ivm podcast app or ivmpodcast.com and while you're at it follow us on twitter and instagram as well at ivm podcast how aware do you think you are of your laws and rights do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations do you know what your rights are when you're stuck somewhere bad well here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are Tune in to Know Your Kanoon with me Amar Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from. Do you have a night routine? Well, everyone has one. And the to-do list usually looks like this. Brush your teeth, set that alarm, get into your pajamas and switch off those screens. But here's one more to add to that list. Tune into the Positively Unlimited podcast for a dose of positive action and tips on how to build powerful mindsets. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you tune into podcasts.